delighted to see all of you here for one of SHOT's annual rituals, uh, which is the ability of the winner of the society's highest honor, the Leonardo da Vinci Medal, uh, to do a presentation. Uh, this year, I'm thrilled to announce that that is Ron Klein. Uh, <clears throat> Before I say a couple of words about Ron, I, I want to have it understood that the award is the product of the Society's Awards Committee, uh, which consists of the chairs of all of the other Society's prize committees. So one of the uh, surprises for every prize committee chair is when they hear from the past president who chairs the awards committee that they also have the obligation to work through the process of selecting the da Vinci winner. Uh, this year, the process went extremely well, and you'll see all the names of those people. I have to thank the, make sure you recognize the work of the committee, and we'll recognize them at the banquet on Saturday evening. Um, but this year, it was a, a pretty easy deliberation uh, for the, with this year's winner. Um, Ron is a, a stalwart member of the society. He began his undergraduate career and finished at Kansas State in a fashion that's quite typical of many historians of technology of the earlier time with an engineering degree, in this case electrical engineering. Uh, worked at General Electric for a period of time before deciding that perhaps there were other fields that were of interest, and then he went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison where he earned his PhD with Terry Reynolds, who became a colleague of mine at Michigan Tech and himself uh, was a stalwart member of the society. Um, Ron's list of accomplishments are many, and I just wish to identify a couple of them. Uh, he received the society's very first, in fact, the inaugural IEEE History Prize in 1988 for an article in Technology and Culture entitled Science and Engineering Theory in the Invention and Development of the Induction Motor, 1880 to 1900. He proceeded to then spend, after leaving Madison, time at the IEEE History Center, which also was an organization just beginning its career at that time. He worked with some really interesting people, people that names you'll recognize in the society, Robert Friedel, Joyce Beatty, Bob Casey, and set that organization on a path that it, where it has continued to grow and to be a very important organization inside of our field. But in 1987, the opportunity came for Ron to go to the position and, at that time, assistant professor, tenure track in the SDS program at Cornell, a position that he still holds. And I think if I got it right, Ron, uh, next year will be your 30th year at, at Cornell. Uh, in that time, he has published three, three books, all of them, I think, significant. Biography of Steinmetz, which uh, builds on that early work in electric electricity. Um, most recent book was on the cybernetics movement, cybernetics moment, or why we call our age the information age. And then a book that I've actually used significantly in class that looks at changing technology at the turn of the 20th century, uh, a book called Consumers in the Country, Technology and Social Change in Rural America. There's very much more to, to what Ron has accomplished I think most important is a consistent and steady effort, not just to the IEEE, but also to the society, which culminated in his term as president. Uh, one of the things you may not be aware when you're nominated for president, but becomes very clear is you spend two years as vice president, two years as president, and two years as past president. It's a six year term. He finally finished last year, but it is a delight then to welcome him to the stage to present this year's uh, speech by the Da Vinci winner for 2016, Ron Klein. Uh, this is a very much an honor and a privilege, uh, humbled by this honor. Uh, I want to thank Bruce from the committee for the selection. Uh, when Dave Luxco um, informed me of the good news, uh, he reminded me that, uh, quote, uh, typically uh, Da Vinci plenaries mix autobiographical reflections with larger historical themes of importance to the winner. So during my presidential, shop presidential address, I did do a historiographic piece 
uh, of several themes that had changed in the history of technology since John Stoudemire, uh, from the time John Stoudemire published uh, Technology Storytellers in 1985, Two Shots, uh, 50th anniversary meeting 2007. So I'm not going to do that tonight. Uh, what I am going to do, and this is a, a reflection back on, on, on my own work, is to look at that work through one theme, and it was not a theme I started with, but it's a theme I ended, well, the last book is with, I have not ended yet. Um, so uh, the theme is humans and machines, okay. Um, interpreted broadly, this theme does not say much because it covers all of the history of technology. That's especially true if the category humans includes all artifacts and embodied techniques. Pardon me, if in category humans includes all organizations as well as individuals, and artif machines includes all artifacts and embodied techniques. So what I want to talk about is more specific. I'll focus on two aspects of this historical relationship between humans and machines, the use of technology and the attempts to create a science that could explain what it meant to be human in an age of intelligent machines. When I made uh, what turned out to be a rather difficult transition from being an engineer to being, becoming a historian of technology from the late 1970s to the early 1980s, I had the good fortune to be mentored and encouraged by several tech teachers and colleagues. Bruce has already mentioned Terry Reynolds, but I will also mention Ron Numbers at the University of Wisconsin. And in Schott, and this tradition existed uh, when I was a gra graduate student, I think it still exists today, by people outside of Wisconsin at Schott, particularly Ed Layton, Tom Hughes, and Rose Smith. At Cornell, my colleague Trevor Pinch, and early graduate students such as Ray Fouché and Suzanne Moon stretched me intellectually in ways I could not have imagined when I started that journey. So looking back, a, a good part of my research has contributed to our profession's criticism of every part of the thesis expressed in the model of the 1933 Chicago World's Fair, science finds, industry apply, applies, man conforms. So drawing on the work of Reynolds, Leighton, and Walter Vincenti, I argued in my book on Steinmetz that his theories of electrical machines helped create a quasi-autonomous engineering science, which practicing engineers applied rather than physics to invent electrical systems at the turn of the century. I chose to write about Steinmetz. I'm going to mix in some autobiographical uh, comments here. I chose to write about Steinmetz, the hunchback socialist chief engineer of the General Electric Company in the United States because I was intrigued by him when I worked as an electrical engineer there in the 1970s. The second half of the book deals with his attempts to professionalize engineering, his socialism, and the creation of a public image that rivaled that of Edison in the U.S. in the 1920s. When I worked at GE, I was skeptical enough not to be taken in by the company's attempts to use photos of Steinmetz working in a canoe on a river near his cabin to humanize the corporation. Yet I still wondered why this bastion of capitalism would let a renowned socialist be its chief engineer. In graduate school, I discovered that his politics were a right-wing form of socialism, which praised the industrial corporation as the model of a future socialist society. It was an unpleasant discovery for an ex-hippie engineer with long hair, fry boots, and a red beard, this is a long time ago, uh, to make. But it did help me relate his engineering work inside the company to his attempts outside the firm to reform engineering, to make engineers more socially responsible. Now, the, the Steinmetz book, and this is kind of the ad hoc nature of this talk a little bit, looking back, the Steinmetz book, Steinmetz's book deals only slightly with the theme of humans and machines, as I've talked about it here. As a committed socialist, Steinmetz believed that engineers would help usher in a utopia in which benign merit-based corporations such as GE govern society through an industrial senate. He thought electricity would decentralize politics and clean up the pollution caused by burning coal in cities and homes. It was a political philosophy of technological determinism 
that set the conditions for the relationship between humans and machines. The electrical systems that his mathematical equations help make possible, he thought, would lead to beneficial social and political changes. Stymus assumed that ordinary people would use the new technologies of electric light and power systems, emerging in the street and in hotels, factories, and homes in the manner prescribed by the electrical industry, by the modernizers, to create a utopia of shorter work days, more leisure, and longer, more prosperous lives. And all society had to do to reach this Eden was to allow industrial corporations to cooperate with each other to build this electrical infrastructure of modernity. In contrast, my work on technology in rural life, which, which Bruce mentioned, took up with the theme of humans and machines in earnest. In consumers in the country, I turned Simons' technological determinism, which I had critiqued in the book, on its head to argue against the gendered man conforms part of the 1933 World's Fair model. Inspired by the, by the work of Ruth Cowan on household technology, Claude Fisher on the telephone, and David Nye on electrification, I shifted my focus from engineers to users. Autobiographically, instead of drawing on my experience as a GE engineer, GE engineer I drew on my experience growing up in a small town in the midwestern part of the United States. I was fortunate enough to document remarkably rich and complex relationships between humans and machines in rural life. I found plenty of archival evidence and published evidence that farm men and women took the new technologies of the telephone, the automobile, the radio, electric light and power into their own hands and used them to their own ends in the United States from about 1900 to 1960. In this counter narrative, and it is a counter narrative, farm people built their own cooperative telephone systems when AT&T did not serve the countryside, attacked the dangerous devil wagon automobile driven into the country by city folks, and then adapted it to do such tasks as shelling corn and washing clothes. They tuned in the country rather than the city on the radio, resisted the Rural Electrification Administration as a New Deal government agency, and selectively purchased electrical appliances. Through these actions, I argued, they created their own versions of rural modernity. Instead of adopting the urban domestic ideal that manufacturers and the REA worked so hard to convince them to accept. There was a very close and personal relationship between humans and machines. And quite frankly, I didn't realize that part of it until Roz Williams made that comment when I gave a paper on this. She said, you're talking about a really personal relationship between these folks and technology. It was made possible by the rural traditions of independence, making do, tinkering, visiting, and cooperation that existed on middle class farms and in farming communities in the US, especially before World War II. In my youth, I had seen vestiges of these practices. I listened to stories about them from my grandfather, who had run threshing machines in the wheat fields of Oklahoma during World War I, and from my grandmother, whom I had seen kill a chicken by wringing its neck with the aid of a rake handle. That's about as far away from the urban domestic ideal as you can get. My father, an inveterate tinkerer of farm machinery and Model Ts, served as an aircraft mechanic in World War II. When the war ended, the Kleins moved from the farm to run a hardware store in a very small town that sold gas and electrical appliances to town folk and surrounding farmers. We lived on five acres on the edge of town, kept sheep, calves, and chickens. In the 1950s, we were on a telephone party line, several people on one line. When the phone would ring, everybody's phone would ring, on which our phone number was, yeah, I can still remember this. I checked it with my mom, who's 89 the other day. I, on which our phone number was the Morse code ring of one long and two shorts. You rung that by turning a crank extending from the side of a wooden cabinet of a phone on the wall. Thus, when I found evidence in the archives that American farmers in the early 20th century were setting up talk fest and playing music for the neighbors on their own party lines, I recognized that they had transformed the rural custom of visiting, which still existed when I was a kid, in person to the new telephone lines. They had co-opted the new medium to continue the rural practices, which were transformed in turn. 
And as tempting as listening in was a kid like, my, like me, it was taboo in our household. At the start of this project, my colleague Trevor Pinch asked me if I wanted to collaborate with him on a paper on the social construction of the automobile for a conference to be held in Norway. He thought I might have material on Steinmetz's electric car that we could draw upon. Instead, I sent him a photo of a distant family member in Nebraska who had jacked up the rear wheel of a car so his wife could do the wash on the farm in the 1930s. Trevor was intrigued by the extreme interpretive flexibility of the car depicted in the photo, and we started working on the paper, Users as Agents of Technological Change, which Technology and Culture published 20 years ago this year. And it was not without some trouble. It was rejected at first. Uh, and the, in the transition, the editors from Bob Post to uh, John Stoudemire, it was accepted. I wanted to stretch the social constru construction of technology to cover such power relations as gender, structure, and identity, which, which was a typical criticism of Scott very early on. I think Trevor wanted to do some more colonizing for his and V.V. Baker's brand of social constructivism. We worked well together, meeting weekly in my quiet office in engineering to sort out the division of labor for research, analysis, and writing. The only major point on which we disagreed had to do with the theme of humans and machines. Trevor wanted to discuss only those interpretations of the car that led to changes in the artifact. For example, using the car to plow the fields prompted companies to bring out tractor kit kits for autos, turning an auto into a tractor, and using the car to do the wash prompted manufacturers to add a power takeoff option to tractors. Trevor wanted to focus on the theme of users as agents of technological change in order to retain the sharp analytical edge of Scott, the social construction of technology. I wanted to talk about all social interpretations of the rural car, uses that led to technological change and those that did not such as farm women using the car to run their egg business and expand their traditional gender roles. In the terms of the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, it was a classic clash between the hedgehog, who saw the world through one grand idea, and the fox, who wanted to explore many things. We settled this friendliest of disputes by focusing on innovative users for the paper in technology and culture, which led to much good work in the sociology and history of innovative users. I added the broader uses back in to the chapter on the car in consumers in the country. As an example, the mutual construction of technology and social change. I think if you read the TNC piece and the chapter together, you get a clear sense of historian David Edgerton's criticism of Scott for focusing on technological innovation even when it deals with users. Let me turn now to the history of cybernetics and information theory in the United States. These new post-World War II sciences grappled with the question of what it meant to be human in the emerging age of electronic computers. When I began to speak on this research about a decade ago, it's actually over a decade ago, I found that uh, Claude Shannon's information theory would put audiences to sleep, or my version of it would put audiences to sleep, whereas Norbert Wiener's cybernetics would wake them up and lead to lots of questions. As a former engineer who had worked on the computer control systems that could launch nuclear missiles from submarines, which gave me a deferment during the Vietnam War, I could not understand why cybernetics, which drew on control engineering, was considered to be so cool in the 21st century. I thought the digital age owed a greater debt to information theory. Fred Turner's wonderful book, uh, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, helped clear up that mystery. Fred shows that American artists, musicians, and readers of Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog viewed cybernetics as a means to liberate them from the technocracy of big brother computer systems. This digital utopianism, as he calls it, grew out of what Turner calls the forgotten openness of the closed world. Yet I knew from my previous life as a computer engineer and from my current life at Cornell, where one of my offices is down the hall from faculty in control engineering and information theory, 
that there was more to the story. I recall that GE engineers had interpreted communication and control system, the basis of cybernetics, in a closed Cold War fashion. Furthermore, my engineering colleagues at Cornell informed me that cybernetics still had a flaky scientific reputation in the United States, precisely because of its association with the counterculture. Why are you so interested in Norbert Wiener, they ask. Claude Shannon is the important figure. But to me, Shannon was boring and Wiener was exciting. So I studied the cybernetics craze in the US in the 1950s and 1960s. I did find that there was also a great deal of intellectual excitement about information theory at the time, even when it wasn't tied to cybernetics. Shannon wasn't so boring after all. Even though he had tried to tamp down the enthusiasm for information theory, in a famous editorial called The Scientific Bandwagon. My engineering colleagues praised it to me 50 years later in a not so subtle form of what sociologists of science call boundary work. The theme of humans and machines was not on my radar at this time, even though I had taught Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto in the 1990s, and I had written a book on the use of technology. That changed in the first decade of this century when I began teaching science fiction novels in my undergraduate classes, and I helped super supervise Heidi Vosko's wonderful PhD dissertation on automata in the 18th century Europe. In graduate seminars, I began to come to grips with literary theorist N. Catherine Hale's provocative 1990 book, How We Became Posthuman. The book deals with the disembodiment of information the creation of the cyborg as a technological artifact and cultural icon, and quote, how a historically specific construction called the human is giving way to a different construction called the posthuman. By posthuman, Hales refers to the loss of human subjectivity, characteristic of the European Enlightenment, not a reconstruction of the body through cyborg engineering. Although I criticized Hale's presentist imprint, criti uh, criticized Hale's presentist history of cybernetics and her treatment of Wiener and Shannon, her book impressed on me the importance of the theme of humans and machines to cybernetics. I kept that in mind while writing the cybernetics moment. I tried to explain why so many scientists, engineers, and humanists in the US in the 1950s and 60s thought cybernetics could shed new light on the age-old question about the relationship between humans and machines. For them, the basis of cybernetics was a powerful analogy, that the principles of information feedback machines, which, which explain how a thermostat controlled a household furnace, for example, could also explain how all living things, from the level of the cell to that of the society, behaved as they interacted with their environment. Central to their quest was cybernetic modeling. Human brains were modeled as electronic digital computers, as, pardon me, human brains were modeled as electronic digital computers by neuroscientist Warren McCulloch and, math, and mathematician Walter Pitts, who equated neural nets to a Turing machine. In turn, digital computers were modeled as human brains when mathematician John von Neumann used the theory of McCulloch and Pitts to describe what has erroneously been called the von Neumann computer architecture, the hallmark of digital computing. In the human sciences, researchers in the US use cybernetics and information theory to model humans as machines in regard to behavior. Such notable figures as cognitive psychologist George Miller employed an information calculus to model human judgments and structure of language. Herbert Simon, another prominent social scientist, employed feedback circuits to model human decision-making and social interactions in psychology, management science, political science, and psychology. In the 1970s, anthropologist Gregory Bateson, the husband of the more famous anthropologist Margaret Mead, became a guru to the, counter, to the ecological wing of the counterculture when he created a radical epistemology of cybernetics. In Bateson's holistic concept, the computer was a small part of an information feedback circuit that extended from the human organism to its environment and back again, forming what he called an imminent mind. So the whole circuit is an, a mind that is imminent in that pathway. This, epistemolo this epistemology led to the current movement, 
known as second order cybernetics. Researchers in the physical sciences and engineering used cybernetics to model machines as human. They created novel artifacts in the areas of bionics, artificial intelligence, and cyborgs. Uh, several cyberneticians and information theorists were involved in this effort. Claude Shannon helped organize the 1950s Conference on Artificial Intelligence, which gave the field its name. Warren McCulloch at MIT and Heinz von Forster at the University of Illinois created artificial neural networks in AI. They also helped establish the new military fund in the field of bionics. I used to think bionics meant like a merger of electronics and biology. No, what the original meaning was to look at living systems, how they had evolved over time, these complex systems became very robust to design better electronic systems like for uh, jet fighters and so forth. In the same period, researchers fused humans with machines to create cyborgs, cybernetic organisms. It's well known that the term was coined by researchers in, in space medicine in 1960 who proposed embedding cybernetic systems such as an artificial heart and the feedback monitoring of anti-radiation drugs in the bodies of U.S. astronauts to enable them to explore outer space without clumsy spacesuits. Fortunately, NASA's cyber project did not get off the ground. Since then, as we know, the word cyborg has come to denote a wide range of human-machine constellations from the heart patient with a pacemaker, to enemy cyborgs on Star Trek, to Donna Haraway's concept of an ironic political myth that can break down dualisms of race and gender. In 1950, Norbert Wiener wrote a popular book on the social implications of cybernetics that covers all of these issues and is still in print today. In the human use of human beings, Wiener warned of the unemployment and other social ills that would result from the misapplication of cybernetics by authoritarian governments in regard to automatic factories, robots, and also he warned about the secrecy in military-funded research. Yet he also thought cybernetics would strengthen liberal democracy if it was applied correctly to language, law, education, and government. Passages such as his thought experiment of transmitting a human over a telegraph line by sending the information needed to reconstruct the human at the other end, continued to fascinate today's students. So there's the idea of a computer as a communication machine, not as what we know it today, as the model, as the smart terminal of a communications network, but as a standalone machine that forms an information feedback loop with its user. After 65 years, I think the human use of human beings is still a good book to think with, I assign it to my undergraduates. They cannot skim the book because Wiener does not have topic sentences at the start of each paragraph. And most of them find it fascinating that this book was written in 1950. I argue that when the cybernetics moment ended in the US in the 1970s, as cybernetics and information theory lost their status in the, U in the US as universal sciences, that this rich way of talking about humans and information machines also ended. I argue that it was replaced by an impoverished discourse of information as commodified data, big data, and cyber as an all-purpose, nearly meaningless adjective. One can see the beginnings of this change in Stuart Brand's remarkable booklet, Two Cybernetic Frontiers. Published in 1974, it contains two articles. One is on the frontier of, of organic cybernetics. This is, this is uh, Brand's term. And that's uh, Bate, Gregory Bateson's work. The second is on what he calls the frontier machine cybernetics. And this was uh, his, his famous article on the computer bums about research at Stanford AI and the Xerox Park uh, Laboratory. Although Brand predicted correctly that machine cybernetics would make computers accessible, which it did through inventing a graphical user interface for the personal computer and the internet, for example, he gave its second billing behind the organic cybernetics, behind the piece by Bateson. Quote, what Bateson was getting at will indirectly inform damn near everybody's lives. Bateson 
stretches the theme of humans and machines, I think, almost to its limit. It's far beyond Stymus's technological determinism and the, effort, and the efforts of farm people to adapt urban technology to rural life and first order cybernetics, the cybernetics that most people think of when they use that term. For Bateson, cybernetics was not merely a means to model humans as machines, nor was he interested in creating human-like robots, nor was he interested in fusing humans with machines into cyborgs, the site of so much work in today's machine cybernetics. Bateson was after bigger game, a theory of imminent mind, a mind imminent in feedback loops connecting humans with their environment. Like Stuart Brand, Bateson believed that organic cybernetics could help solve the environmental crisis of the 1970s by showing the unity between mind and nature. And I think that is a far cry from designing a better human computer interface based on user studies. So last night, uh, Bruno Latour uh, talked about cybernetics in uh, the work of, in the Gaia system and the Earth Sciences model. And basically, I don't know if Bruno's here, but what he's talking about is essentially first order cybernetics where the engineer is a outside the system. He's analyzing the system with a black, like a black box with inputs and outputs and uh, trying to stabilize the system in a homeostatic way so you know, we don't have runaway climate change. That's first order cybernetics, which Bateson criticized for being narrow. What he was proposing, and in an interview with me, done with uh, Brand in 1976, what's since been called second order cybernetics, was to put the engineer and everyone else who studies systems inside the system to be studied. So he called it the science of, of observing systems. So the engineer no longer has a privileged position outside to analyze the system or to try to control it. And I agree with Bruno that I don't think geoengineers would like that position. And they would not uh, take kindly uh, to be an outside expert to that. So let me conclude with a story about the hospitality of shot. I first experienced this when I attended my first meeting in Toronto, I'm pretty sure it's Toronto, in 1980. And I gave a paper in a dissertation in progress session, which was common at that time, chaired by Merritt Will Smith. In the question and answer period, an old gentleman with white hair stood up and said in a cranky, authoritative voice, unless I've forgotten everything I ever knew about electrical engineering, Steinmetz did invent the method of solving differential equations by complex quantities which I had said he didn't, was not the topic of the paper. The paper was about Steinmetz's public image and how GE had used that to uh, fight antitrust suits. But in the beginning, I had said that Steinmetz did not invent the method that's known by his name. I replied that I was not surprised that he held this view because textbooks had start, stated it, as a matter of fact, since the turn of the 20th century. My research showed, I said, that the method was invented simultaneously by several engineers, including Steinmetz, and that it came to be called Steinmetz's method because he popularized it in numerous articles and books. The old gentleman sat down in a huff. I later learned that he was John Brainerd, past president of Schott, who had headed the pioneering ENIAC computer project at the University of Pennsylvania in World War II. After the session ended, Rose Smith and others came up to me and said I had handled Brainerd's question well. They made me feel welcome, that I was no longer an engineer. And part of that was when I was first in graduate school, I thought because I was an engineer, I kind of have a privileged position to analyze the history of it. And I was soon disabused of that at the <laughs> University of Wisconsin, which is a really good thing. Uh, and I had an experience that I could start from, not an experience I could use to analyze things. They made me feel welcome, that I was no longer an engineer, that I was part of an exciting intellectual enterprise of writing the history of technology, 
even if it meant challenging the account of a famous historical actor. I'm happy to say that during my 30 years of teaching at Cornell, that my graduate students have experienced the same feeling of being welcome and shot that I felt. It pleases me, no, and it pleases me to no end to watch the more senior scholars among them extend support and encouragement to graduate students who have found their way into our field and who will transform our field in the process. Thank you. Uh, hello, I guess I'm the first one to ask the question, but uh, I was very excited about the book. And uh, because we are talking here that now we do not make a division between technology and science, so I'm going to ask more of a kind of um, question that goes into this science direction. I think that, that should be fine. Um, so, that's, I mean, the, the transition that you're explaining with the sort of the metaphors and sort of this poor kind of cybernetics that resides in the popular discourse, that's one direction, and I think you show it very convincingly, but I also know your own work on the, for instance, the history of artificial intelligence, right? So what if we look not into the realm of a discourse, but in the realm of academic discipline formation, right? It's, I think, also very interesting intersection between how cybernetics remains a powerful expression for holding some of the disciplinary identities all while sort of some of the ideas are appropriated all while sort of the disciplinary model of a cybernetics is rejected by the international community of computer scientists. Yeah, very good question. Uh, I uh, had that little uh, issue when I first started my research because the claim is, of course, cybernetics never died, uh, that it was dissolved or taken out by other disciplines, and you can see it everywhere, you know, in AI and engineer, you know, control engineering, control engineering, information science, and so forth. So what I was interested, in, and also one good solid piece of evidence for that, from my point of view, uh, where cybernetics is actually used under its own name, is at by Rodney Brooks at the uh, a, at the AI at the new well, what's at the AI laboratory at MIT, where he, use, he actually goes back to use a British cyberneticians uh, work. So here's how I decided to tackle that because I did not like that explanation. To me, it was way too easy because there is this question of what happened to cybernetics. So why I call the book The Cybernetics Moment is that this moment where almost every intellectual that I've uh, read, like hum uh, social scientists, humanists in the US, in the 1950s and 60s, has to come to grip, wants to come to grip, feels they have to come to grip with cybernetics and information theory as a universal science, as a science that can cover, not just create robots, but can solve all kinds of problems across the disciplines. So when I say the cybernetics moment ended, that's what I'm referring to, is that theory of cybernetics. And in fact, uh, in a chapter I have called Cybernetics in Crisis, where cybernetics has been criticized, I bring up the fact that the CIA was a founder, helped establish an agent from the CIA, working in the science and technology office, is founding, organizing the American Society of Cybernetics precisely because he thinks the Soviet Union is winning the cybernetics gap uh, with the US. And in fact, uh, Jer Jerome Wiesner at MIT and others that go to the Soviet Union, and they're running this question too. So there was a strong belief among my actors that this view of cybernetics as this overall, I'm sorry, I talked with my hand, this overall discipline uh, had ended. And I agree, you can, you can find control theory, you, you know, AI and so forth. Now there's a revival of cybernetics. I, I know about this because people send me emails, they say, can you come to the conference? talk at our conference because we want to re use cybernetics to reform the human science, sciences. Andy Pickering's a sociologist, wants to use cybernetics to reform science itself, right? So I know there's a revival underway. And so what I chose to do was to look at those actors who use the cybernetic label itself, rather than to try to look at all the different theories as, as they were spread out. Does that help with your I question? I will talk to you later. <laughs> OK, OK, good, good, good. So wonderful to see you here, and I'm very proud um, to be here and to have been your student. I was curious, you talked about the moment when you felt welcome at SHOT mm -hmm. and um, SHOT's hospitality. I'm curious about the reverse direction back into 
engineering where you came from. And I think that I know it mattered to you all those years that you also had this office in the engineering department at Cornell. I'm just curious about is there anything in the last 30 years that you've been there, in the history of engineering in those 30 years? Is there a continuity or a discontinuity that you would like to mention, or a couple of them? What happened in the last 30 years of an SDS professor living in engineering? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, as I said, changes, continuities, interesting moments, this kind of thing. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. A lot of my graduate students, uh, Heidi, and I see a few others back there, uh, they would come over to my office in engineering because it's a lot quieter over there. <laughs> you know, there's nobody going to interrupt the conversation over there. Yeah, that's a really good question. Okay. Um, when I was hired, I was hired under the Minnesota model of the history of science. And so there was no SNTS, there was no science and technology studies department. There was a science, technology, and society field. So the, the model was since I studied electrical engineering, they would place me in the department whose subject I studied, which is electrical engineering. But we, what, what Cornell doesn't have, uh, what Minnesota has, is the, the tradition of that. I think you know, that grant in the 19, late 80s was the first one of that. Um, they didn't know what to make of me, uh, except for a few people. And some, one of the people I'm, I'm citing in here that's saying, why are you studying Wiener, uh, was one of my biggest supporters. <laughs> was one of my biggest supporters. There's also tradition, as you may remember, Cornell, with, with the Science and Technology Society program, and then the Science and Technology Studies pro, uh, department was over in Clark Hall in physics. And my colleague Trevor Pinch says, I like being over here with the physicists, right? I like being over here with the, the people I study. And that's the kind of way I looked at it over there, too. That was, and, now, the engineering ethics program is different because that's an undergraduate program, and we still, I still study engineers uh, when I'm teaching engineering ethics. But I looked at it, these are the people I study, it's nice to be with them. Um, does that quite get it? Uh, I was, for, like I said, I was very fortunate that when the SNTS program was, was founded, that my research was judged by them and my, my undergraduate teaching by them. But I like having that quiet office over there. And a chair came along to you, which was nice. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's so nice to hear how you reflect your uh, major works, the three books that you've uh, authored, uh, through this theme that you said, humans and machines, um, a lens. I think it's quite appropriate, uh, specific, but yet broad enough. Um, my question is, when you, uh, you know, were making when you're uh, making your career. Uh, are you, were you thinking of this overarching intellectual? Okay, no. because I'm just starting. That's, that's why I asked. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but let, me, let me expound on that. It's a good question. And I, I, I tried to say this in the beginning. No, I did not. I started with a, the historiographic question at the time, which is a, there was some talk about that in a couple of sessions today, about the session about, a great session about history of technology and relationship to other disciplines, okay? And so then the biggest question, one of the big questions was the relationship between science and technology. So the philosophers trying to answer that question and historians trying to answer that question. Okay. So my, my advisor was doing that. Ed Layton, one of my mentors, was doing that. Other folks, not so much at all, like Tom Hughes, another men, uh, count as a mentor of mine. So I took that on. I, my, my PhD was in a program, history of science program. There were one, two, two historians, but everybody else was doing history of science. And, Bill Asprey was, I think, uh, and, and Rich, Bill Asprey was doing history of technology. So actually, this question appealed to me because I could study technology and, and not feel like such an outcast in that department, quite frankly. I see. Then the real life is just completely different, right? right. And uh, quite frankly, I got tired of studying engineers, one, one, one of the reasons. And I wanted to study something different, and I wanted to study users. I see. And also, I, was, I admired the work of Ruth Callan and Claude Fisher and uh, David Nye. The cybernetics one, quite frankly, how that came about, there's a podcast about this if you want to know more. <laughs> how that came about was because I, during the dot-com boom, I put the word information in a class I had been teaching since 1987, and the enrollment tripled. And I go, okay, you know, why has this become such a key? This is the dot-com boom. That's where that work started. Why has this become such a boom? Uh, then 
I, was, I realized there was all this other work. So, no, there was no grand plan. I, uh, I tried to say it in the beginning, I'll make it clearer in the text, that when I'm looking back, I want to relate it to one thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. When you talk about cybernetics, advanced technologies, do you see Southeast Asians, for example, as mere spectators, mere users, or active creative participants? Yeah, I'm Southeast Asian in that sense. Again? Uh, spectators, mere users, or creative participants? Yeah. Um, I, first of all, I don't think I'd categorize the whole region like that. I'd, I'd prefer to think about smaller groups, right? Smaller social groups. And uh, whether they're engineers, whether they're uh, people, you know, nice thing about user studies, you can study engineers who have an idea in their mind what a user is like. Imagine user, uh, sociologist uh, Steve Wilgar. So, you, uh, so I, I, I would, I would not, I, I would only answer the question if I knew how to answer, if I knew the answers in regard to, to small groups rather, rather than in, entire region. Uh, okay, all right.